All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today we are talking about the art of uh, using RESTful APIs. Uh, this is Hassan from Microsoft Reactor. And Microsoft Reactors are hubs for founders and developers, as you know, uh, in major cities around the world where developers and startups, uh, founders can come together to learn about technology and explore all the recent and, and, and trending topics. In today's session, we're talking about APIs and APIs are short for Application Programming Interface. It's a convenient way to interface between a user and a product. And in the workshop today, we'll be deep diving into uh, what an API is and how it is used. We'll then show you how to build your own APIs using REST protocols to get images of artwork made public by museums around the world. We'll also learn how to connect to external APIs and query two different sets of data. This is a beginner's workshop that will give you the confidence to start using RESTful APIs on your own. And uh, today's workshop is uh, led by Alan Sanders. He's a senior cloud architect with over 25 years of experience in software engineering, architecture, and design, delivering technology, strategy, and business solutions across multiple verticals. Alan is a motivated leader with experience uh, in effectively partnering with both technical and executive level business stakeholders. I think uh, we have a very exciting uh, session and workshop today. Uh, we're so excited to have you, uh, Alan, with us. Uh, Thank to you. Take us through this, uh, this journey. And as I mentioned uh, earlier uh, to everyone attending today's workshop, uh, we will be sharing some links and resources for you to follow along. So keep an eye on the chat. Uh, send us all your questions there and we will have stops to answer these questions. And at some points, if you also prefer to be uh, uh, mic on uh, to ask these questions at a certain point where we stop for these questions. Also, please mention that to me uh, in the chat and I will uh, enable that feature for you. I think that's all for uh, the introduction. I would love to hand uh, over the mic to Alan to start today's workshop. Great. Thank you, Hassan. I really appreciate that. And welcome, everyone. It's great to be here with you today at this Microsoft Reactor session entitled Explore the Art World Using RESTful APIs. So uh, as Hussam said, uh, APIs are uh, pretty cool. They, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what APIs are, why they are beneficial, why uh, we uh, utilize them, what sort of uh, benefits they give us. And then we're going to talk about sort of the uh, mechanics of what that looks like, all in sort of the context of uh, integrating with a couple of really large uh, museum uh, sites online to get access to their information digitally. And then we'll sort of wrap up and talk about how we can actually get uh, access to the information programmatically as well. So it is uh, truly an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today. And I'm really excited to get into this. So why don't we go ahead and uh, look to get started. As Hussam said, um, there is uh, the opportunity to ask questions. Please feel free to do that as we go along. Um, I'm going to try to make this as interactive as we can, uh, given that it's virtual, but definitely want you to feel like if you have questions that you're able to get them answered as we proceed. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and uh, just uh, another quick word about reactors. I know Hussam mentioned the benefit of them, and, and I am a big fan. I just want to sort of plug that uh, myself as well. You know, technology is ever changing. There's always something new to learn. Uh, trying to stay ahead of that curve, uh, te technologically speaking, can be a challenge. Uh, and things like the reactor, where we as community members can come together and partner with one another and learn from one another, I think are, are going to be really, really great tools uh, to help us, um, you know, sort of along that journey, right? And uh, Hussam just mentioned or, or posted a link to the, the meetup uh, information as well. Definitely, uh, it's great for you to take advantage of these kinds of things. See what you can do to help others, see what you can learn from others. And uh, together as a community, I think we can uh, continue to advance uh, each of our uh, mutual interests as we proceed on this journey. So uh, one of the great things about the reactors uh, is that, um, you know, they're all over the world. There are available sessions at multiple times, multiple locations. 
Um, I'm hoping there's a time when we can get together again uh, in person. Uh, I think that'll be coming. But until such time, these types of, of virtual sessions where we can connect uh, can be very, very beneficial and really provide some options. And as uh, Hussam mentioned, that that uh, survey gives you an opportunity to kind of weigh in on uh, what times look good, what types of topics you want to talk about, et cetera, because we want this to meet you where you are. OK. So quick uh, note about our code of conduct uh, as we are together uh, as a community and learning together. Um, it's just think, a, a few things to remember. It's very, very, you know, common sense kind of things. Right. Let's be aware of each other. Let's be friendly and patient. Learning takes patience, right? Takes patience with ourselves, takes patience with others. There are going to be questions. Uh, different people are on different uh, points of that journey. Just uh, let's definitely be friendly and patient with one another. Be welcoming and respectful. Be open to all viewpoints and questions. Be understanding of differences and be kind and considerate to others. We do that. I think we're going to uh, come away from this as a successful community that is really uh, going to be stronger together than we would be individually or separately. All right. So uh, explore the art world using RESTful APIs. And again, I think this is kind of fun, right? So the technical topic of, S, uh, of APIs, which, you know, I find fun, but you know, maybe different people find different levels of fun there. But looking at that through the lens of, you know, how do we connect to uh, museums uh, across the world and pull information about their exhibits and pictures about their exhibits? And, you know, how could we build out even a programmatic flow to make that information available, uh, you know, on our own sites or in our own applications is kind of what we're talking about here. So we're using the art world as a, a sort of a use case to help drive the importance and the uh, benefits of APIs. Uh, Usam uh, gave me a very, very nice introduction there. I really appreciate that, Usam. Um, I've been doing this for a while and I've been uh, doing it in a few different uh, sort of capacities and on different uh, scales. Um, the one thing that I want you to know about me though, sort of most importantly, is that I am passionate about learning. I'm passionate about my own learning. I'm passionate about your learning, others learning, uh, and that's why I do this. So I'm glad you're here. Really, really hoping that you get some great information out of this. As Hussam said, you know, we're gonna be just sort of touching the surface of APIs. We'll drill a little bit uh, down, but you know, unfortunately we only have uh, 60 minutes. What I'm hoping is this that, is that this gives you sort of a springboard and a foundation that you can then continue to build upon. So here's our agenda. We're gonna talk quick introduction. We're gonna talk about what is an API, drill into that a little bit. We're going to build a local API just to sort of see how the mechanics of that uh, operate. Uh, then we're gonna have our first sort of external art world uh, integration with the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York City that API. We're going to talk uh, authentication strategies, right? So when we expose an API or we call an API, um, there are uh, a lot of times where uh, the, the calling side and the receiving side want to know who's who. They want to be able to validate and verify each side of those, uh, each side of that conversation to make sure that it's, uh, you know, uh, secure that we're not uh, bleeding information uh, that others could sort of uh, listen into, and that we have a secure connection and channel through which we can transfer information. So we'll talk about authentication strategies a little bit. Then we will look at our second uh, sort of museum uh, API, which is uh, relative to the Smithsonian's, the Q Cooper Hewitt API. That one will uh, give us a chance to sort of drill a little farther into what some of the, AP, uh, the authentication you know, mechanisms look like. We'll talk about, um, you know, handling responses, using libraries programmatically. So up, up to, you know, sort of this section, we're going to be doing everything manually in terms of hitting the API. And then here we'll talk about what does it look like to leverage uh, a library within a programming language to bring API integration into our own code, okay? And then depending on where we are with time, we may have a final knowledge check and then a summary to sort of wrap everything up. Okay, uh, again, as we proceed, please feel free to leverage that Q&A uh, chat, you know, uh, post your questions there as they come to you. 
Um, and I will try to, you know, sort of keep an eye on that as we go and make sure that we can get those addressed, um, you know, as close uh, to the point that you ask them as uh, possible. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk introduction. And I know uh, Hussam posted this in uh, the chat. This, if you want to follow along, this is a great opportunity to do it, right? And let me make this a little larger to ensure that you can see. Um, this is Microsoft Learn. And I think Microsoft Learn is an awesome uh, tool. Uh, there are modules on just about anything and everything you can uh, imagine. And um, the reason I like Microsoft Learn is because it does, in my opinion, a nice job combining documentation, links, information, words with exercises that help reinforce that information. Uh, if you're like me, I kind of learn by doing. So I think these types of things, uh, these types of modules are great because I can uh, read the information and then apply and practice what I'm learning. So we're gonna leverage this. We're gonna be walking through this together. Um, you know, not obviously line by line because that would be a little boring. I've taken some of these words and moved them to slides. We'll use the slides to kind of walk through the words and then take an opportunity to, you know, sort of work through some of the exercises as well. Okay. So uh, if you want to go ahead and hit that link, Hussam posted it again. Thank you. Uh, and you'd be able to you'll be able to follow along as we as we proceed. So what are we covering? Well, we're going to be covering RESTful APIs, right? Um, it's a you know, there are multiple types of APIs. We're sort of going to be focusing on the RESTful ones, and we'll talk about what that means in just a bit. We're going to be building out a simple API, and then we're going to look at some strategies and approaches for connecting. Prerequisites, um, an internet connected browser. Since you're on Teams, uh, it's probably likely that you have an uh, internet connected browser, so that's great. Uh, we're also gonna be looking to have, if you wanna follow along with some of what we're gonna be doing uh, relative to the local API. Uh, if you have Node.js installed locally and NPM installed locally, uh, you'll be good to go. All right, so what is an API anyway? All right. And, you know, as Sam said, API stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Application Programming Interface. And really what an API gives us is the ability to pull extra functionality into our application without having to code that extra functionality. Right. So somebody builds a feature or an application or a set of data they wrap it in an interface that's uh, well-defined. That's the key, right? A lot of times the uh, interface for an API is uh, sometimes termed a uh, contract, right? So when um, I need that functionality, rather than me having to code it uh, everywhere I need it, I can simply pull that API into my code, into my workflow, and get the advantage of that data without having to do all of the work. And so really what we end up with is a box, right? We don't see what's going on inside, but we don't have to. For an API, all we need to know is what kinds of information do you need from me and what kinds of information can I expect to get back, right? That's the interface, the well-defined interface. If we know that, then we can leverage that API without understanding all of the internal workings. And it just really can be a great um, you know, sort of uh, efficiency lift, right? Because rather than you having to rewrite that, maybe there's a function you want to leverage that someone has already written and made available through an API. And immediately, well, almost immediately, let's say, you get that, you get the benefit of that within your own app. A um, couple of types of APIs, right? There are a few different types. Some of them will mention there's uh, SOAP, Simple Object Access Protocol that uses XML. It's a little bit older. More new is REST, Representational State Transfer, which we're gonna uh, look at really. And that is often uh, modernly combined with JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, as far as its uh, messaging format. There might be RPC, Remote Procedure Call, APIs, or some other in-process or embedded libraries. So we're going to be focusing specifically on REST. And the 
the point of REST is uh, it's basically resource based, right? So using URLs with REST, we can access resources through a path that is defined on the URL. And we'll talk about what that looks like in just a little bit. Okay, we're going to be uh, looking at, and if we go back over here, um, you know, you'll see that we're kind of following along with this. We did our introduction. We talked about what is an API. This is a great video that you might want to go back and watch. It talks about APIs like syncs being APIs and how with a sync, I don't need to know, you know, the, the, the data is, the water is in the pipes. I don't need to know what the configuration of the pipes are. All I need to know is if I turn the handle, the water will come out, right? That's the well-defined interface without me needing to understand all of the underlying uh, details that sit behind how it operates. So that's a great video you might want to uh, consider checking out um, that to give you just a, an additional perspective. And I would certainly uh, recommend uh, that, you know, this is going to be posted or the uh, recording of this will be posted to YouTube. You know, definitely <clears throat> rewatch. And then I would strongly suggest kind of going back through this and practicing it again and reading it again, because I think it can be helpful. Uh, you know, maybe you're one of those people that just needs it to see it sort of one time. A lot, a lot of times I need to see uh, something a couple times. So the great thing is you'll have this to be able to go back through uh, as well. I will also share, or we will be sharing, um, a link to uh, a GitHub repo where you can find the slides that I'm walking through as well. Okay, so let's talk uh, local API now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in some cases, what we might want to be able to do is if we're building an application and we want to sort of be able to stub out or mock out an API locally, uh, JSON server, there's a, a, a node pack, and, and I'm sorry, a JavaScript pack, a package that we can leverage via NPM that gives us access to a local API. Right. And so what we can do is create a data structure in a file format and then wrap that with an API. And then uh, what we're going to be using it for is just sort of to demonstrate what those REST calls look like against an API. OK, but we'll use JSON server to uh, be able to sort of manage this. Thanks for posting that, uh, Hussam. Um, the the GitHub uh, link was just posted there. Um, we're going to be using a package called JSON server, right? And with that, we can expose a local a JSON file as a data source, but accessible uh, through API. And uh, we'll talk about how we go about installing that in just a, a bit. Um, and then, so let's talk before we get into the specifics of that. Let's talk quickly about the anatomy of a REST API call. You know, what, what kinds of things are involved? And there's really four major parts that we're going to talk about, right? The first part is the endpoint. And that's really the URL. That's the route to get to the data that we're interested in. And REST is based around resources. So if I want to get all customers, my URL probably ends in customers. If I want to get a specific customer, my URL might end in customers slash I, the ID number for the customer I'm interested in, right? And using that sort of resource-based format on our URLs, we're able to access different types of uh, information. So the endpoint, that's the URL where we, you know, find the data that we're looking for or find the functionality that we're looking for. Uh, there's the method. So HTTP has a set of verbs, they're called, that kind of uh, dictates what type of action you want to take against that endpoint. And we'll talk about what the different actions are here in just a bit. Headers, uh, that gives you a chance to uh, apply some additional information uh, to your request. Often headers are used to indicate, you know, what format are we intending to communicate in? Uh, we might use headers to communicate information about uh, authentication and authorization for security and other things, right? Uh, sometimes we use a header to uh, communicate an API key that gives us access to a particular API. 
So headers are, are valuable. And then there's the data. What are we sending in, right? Part of that interface. What do you need from me to do what I need you to do, right? To, to what's the interface? What do you need? What kind of inputs? Uh, and we can kind of pass that in and that helps initially. So the combination of those things together sort of makes up that REST AP, uh, API call. And the different combinations of them give us different facilities and functions. Any questions or comments, definitely feel free to chime in there in chat. Um, okay. <clears throat> so here are some of the HTTP methods, or as I said, they're sometimes called uh, HTTP verbs. Uh, common ones include get, post, put, patch, and delete. OK, so think about it this way. Get is like usually used to retrieve information. Post is usually used to create something new, to add a new customer, for example. Put and patch are used to edit something, usually. And then delete is used to delete something, right? So if we have a data source that is exposed via API, we want to create a new customer. We want to edit that customer. We want to maybe delete that customer. Uh, we will use the endpoint, input data, the headers, and then a specific verb that corresponds to the action that we intend to take. The difference between put and patch real quick, put is going to edit by replacing the entire thing. Patch is going to edit by allowing you to replace uh, partially. OK, so thinking about this, these four major parts, endpoint, headers, verbs, and uh, data, that gives us sort of uh, what a, a, a REST call looks like. So let's kind of, uh, you know, kind of try this. So I'm going to open up uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. And if you've not used uh, WSL, I think it's a great product. Uh, it gives you the ability to sideload or in parallel load um, a, a Linux distribution in Windows 10 so you can run it natively. So here I'm running Ubuntu within Windows 10. I do a lot of my development through this, but I you know, run it on my Windows 10 machine. Gives you a lot of options. Um, so what we're going to do is I am going to uh, navigate to where I typically keep my source code and then i'm going to make a new directory called rest api and then i'm going to switch into that directory now um, i'm going to launch visual studio code to do some of the things that i'm going to be uh, modifying and working on here you wouldn't have to do this through visual studio code but in my opinion, uh, VS Code is an awesome, an awesome tool. All right, so Visual Studio Code is just an IDE or integrated development environment that you can use to do your development in. And it supports multiple languages. There are extensions um, that allow you to sort of enhance your experience from a developer perspective. And um, it, the nice thing is it's available uh, via, uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's available on Mac OS. Linux and uh, on Windows, okay? And so if you don't have VS Code, I would check it out. If you just uh, search in your browser for download Visual Studio Code, uh, you should get to the site that allows you to download it, and then you can see more uh, about it. I'm gonna use it here. So from this folder, I can just simply type code dot, and it's gonna launch VS Code from this uh, current folder. And now let me increase the size here so it's easier to see. Let me do one more. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand up a local API. Uh, and the way we're gonna do it is with JSON server. So the first step is to create a new file. I'm gonna call it db.json. And then um, here that uh, gives us kind of the information that it uh, expects to be in that file. Rather than you watch me in a boring way type this in, I'm going to simply copy it and then paste it into my file, my JSON file here. Let me get rid of this for now. 
and then uh, I'm going to format the document so that it you know sort of makes it a little bit easier to read. And then this uh, little circle up here means that it's not been saved yet, so I'm going to save it. And let's just take a, a quick look at what this this is going to be our database, right, for our local API. And the database has a an array or collection of what are called objects. Each one of those objects has uh, a data uh, attribute about it or a set of attributes, right? An ID, an item, artist collection and date. So we're going to have this collection of objects that is accessible as an entire collection or accessible uh, as individual items. And we're going to look at now taking this database, right, this file and wrapping it in an API, right? Wrapping it in something that we can access using REST. And then we're gonna go into our browser and hit this API using REST to see what the information we get, okay? So <clears throat> to do that, I'm going to um, install JSON server. So I'm gonna type this command and then before I run it, I'm gonna sort of describe what it's doing. <laughs> So NPM uh, stands for a uh, node package manager. And uh, node package manager is uh, great because um, you it allows you kind of like in the same vein as the APIs we're talking about, it allows you to pull in other libraries to use within your own code. JavaScript based, right? It's node based. Uh, and then node is uh, gonna be a framework that allows us to run uh, JavaScript on the server. So this npm install is going to install uh, a particular package. The package name is json-server and this uh, dash g flag. You can either install a package locally in the local folder or this dash g is going to install it globally. Now the last piece is this sudo. This stands for super user do because I'm going to be manipulating uh, the file uh, structure on my system. I need to run this with elevated privileges. That's what sudo does. So using elevated privileges, I'm going to be able to install this, uh, this package globally. Okay. So let me, because it's uh, elevated privileges, it's asking me to enter my password. And that should go out and pull the necessary packages in. And we now have access to JSON server. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step then is we can basically uh, launch it and ask it to watch our .json file here. And that puts the REST API wrapper around our data. So the way we do that is JSON-server watch and then we just give it the name of the JSON file. And so what this says is, um, okay, hey, we loaded uh, that resource and it is now accessible using this URL. And that's what REST gives us, right? It gives us access to data and functionality uh, using URLs, using those endpoints, right? Combined with the method, the header and the data. So. Quick example, if we come over here, if we type HTTP localhost 3000 forward slash objects, this is gonna submit a get request through REST that's gonna pull back that entire uh, collection of things. Now, you know, we know that we just have this file locally, right, that this sits on top of. But imagine if this information were in a database, right? You wouldn't want uh, people outside of your organization to have uh, access to the internal database necessarily. But if you give them an API, they can get access to the data in a controlled manner. And that's what we're doing here, right? We're getting access to the objects in our database through the REST API. Now, the other thing that you can do, and again, because it's resource based, right? This URL says, give me all the objects. Maybe I say instead, give me object with ID four. And then that will just, again, execute a get, uh, you know, a, a get verb action 
but then pull back the specific object that's associated. So any questions, comments, definitely leverage that uh, chat to take advantage. Okay, so we're uh, so that gives us sort of our first uh, you know look at creating a local API, wrapping a JSON file in a REST interface, and then uh, interacting with that REST interface through REST. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and keep going. So the next thing we're going to do is now move into okay. Outside of, you know, we have our local API. Instead of looking at our local API, <clears throat> let's look at an external API, right? And the first one we're going to look at is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Let me uh, bring that up here. So whenever you're going to uh, integrate with an API, probably one of the first things you're going to want to do is look at the API documentation. That documentation should provide you with the information you need to understand what you uh, have to pass in and to understand what you can sort of expect to get back. Okay, so um, here I'm going to hold down the control key so I don't, so I launch this in a new tab and I'm gonna open up the API documentation for this uh, API. And so what we'll see here is, you know, further down here, uh, you know, how we can go about getting uh, object information, right? What that request might look like, what types of things we can expect to get back, right? What data type, some notes about it, right? Um, we might want to look at getting information about departments. We might want to look at getting information about a specific exhibit. We might want to be able to, to do a search for a particular type of exhibit, right? Those things are all provided as part of the API. And so we're going to kind of take a look at that here in just a minute for with a couple of examples. Now, <laughs> this particular API is wide open. If we go back over here, um, if you look at the terms and conditions page and you look at their license, this is public domain, right? So we don't need any additional information to get this data. We don't need any additional security. Uh, they're just going to ask us to, you know, be responsible and not flood their service with a bunch of requests. And, you know, that's a real thing, right? We're going to talk about this with authentication. Uh, D if you've ever heard of DDoS attacks, distributed uh, uh, distributed denial of service attacks. What can happen sometimes is uh, bad actors can flood an API with so much traffic, so, so much you know, bogus traffic that the API is unable to satisfy real requests, right? So we definitely don't wanna do that. Uh, and that's often why we wrap uh, authentication mechanisms around our APIs is because we wanna make sure that we have a way to control who's coming in. But this gives us an example of something that's a little bit more open and allows us to hit uh, the information before we get talking about authentication. Okay, so <clears throat> say we want to get information about the departments that are uh, at the museum. If I grab this endpoint, and let me do this to make sure that you're able to see it. Here we're going to get the uh, go through the API to get the um, departments resource, right? Just like we said objects before. Now uh, departments, give me all the departments. So when I run this, uh, what I should get is a list of the departments that are available through this API in the museum. And one of these is, for example, arms and armor, department ID four. Well, what if I wanted to do sort of a search within that department for a specific phrase? Well, what we could do is use this search uh, function. Now, every API is going to be different, right? Uh, there are some standards that APIs are sort of supposed to adhere to. But in this particular case, you really need to look at uh, whoever built the API. What have they, you know, um, provided? What have they exposed? What do the features and functions look like? And so with uh, this API, 
I'm able to grab this endpoint. Let me copy it. Let me paste it. And so now we're going to use this search function by passing in some data, right, that allows us to fine tune our query. So we're saying here, I want you to give me uh, everything in uh, the uh, department ID four that has uh, this concept of embossed silver somewhere within that exhibit. And so using this API, right, using this uh, format, if I navigate here and run it, we're now potentially gonna get back uh, a bunch of object IDs, right? Now, imagine, right, we're doing each one of these things uh, manually. But imagine you had this built into an application, right? And so your application could automatically, you know, maybe you give your user the ability to select a, a department dropdown, right? And they select uh, the arms and armor department. And then maybe you give them a text box where they can enter in a, a, a query string or a search string, like, and they enter embossed silver. And then they say, you know, show me these things. What you can do is take that data you know, translate it, pass it into the API, get back all of the objects, and then you can make subsequent calls to get each one of the objects and display them to the user, right? So there are multiple options you can do with this, but if you imagine we're doing this manually in an application, you'd have all of these steps sort of sitting behind maybe one button click, okay? So these are uh, the exhibits, that are in that arms and armor department that have the concept of embossed silver somewhere in their description or definition. And then finally, if we grab this one, so 626019, we're gonna grab that one. If I bring that up, here's all the data about that exhibit including this primary image right here. So if I grab this link, I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna open this here. There's the image that's associated with that exhibit. Now again, you if you have this data, right, as your response, you can parse it programmatically grab that URL for that image and maybe display a thumbnail on your on your site, right? You're building an application that gives access to this data. You can piece all of these calls together to give the user an experience that is truly rich. And that's what APIs give you, right? You don't have to capture all of this data. The Metropolitan Museum of Art captures and owns and manages all of this data. They just make it available for your use through the API. Okay. So again, any questions, any comments, definitely feel free to uh, reach out there. Looks like we might have gotten one now. How to create a custom endpoint. So the question was, how do you create a custom endpoint uh, in an API? <clears throat> so depending on the programming language that you're looking at, right? Um, as you're building your API, um, you might be leveraging, for example, a pattern called MVC or model view controller. With model view controller, for example, the controller would expose a method that is callable through REST. And then, um, you know, that method uh, once it's hit over rest could then call to other downstream components for building out the uh, you know the application so that endpoint might be on the controller it really depends on the language model view controller is a common pattern you would build a uh, rest accessible endpoint on that controller and then the controller would interface with the model and the view potentially to uh, give you that that data how to have multiple search parameters in boss silver object type helmet period Greek etc. Yeah, so um, I you, we'd have to look in and maybe we can do uh, here real quick. Let's see what this looks like. There's a lot of search. Let's do this. Uh, 
I don't know with this particular endpoint, but a lot of times what uh, endpoints will allow. So that's a great question, right? What if I wanted to search for multiple multiple things? A lot of times the endpoint allows you to either enter all of that information, right? Enter all of the different keywords you're interested in, or there might be, you know, search term one, search term two. There might be a facility within the search term to separate using, uh, you know, ampersands or some type of a character that separates the two different types of things you want to search for. It really depends on what the um, a API is made available. Um, and um, in this particular case, I'm not familiar enough with the API to know what of that it allows. OK, so uh, but that would be uh, something that the API often does, right, is give you the ability to combine those searches. All right, so we've got a couple of questions coming in. It would be helpful if you can use add-on to format the return, JSON. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, my, that's probably a good idea. There are add-ons that you can uh, apply to your browser that will give you more of a uh, pretty prettified view of your JSON. That's a good point. I, I didn't do that prior to this. Can a badly written request overload the API? A query with multiple subselects, for example, in SQL? Absolutely, right? So uh, depending on um, you know, what kind of functionality is exposed from the API and what type of controls have been built into the API, if we're not careful, requests could come in and basically put a, an ex, uh, you know a load onto our service such that it uh, kind of slows it down, right? So what we do there is we build controls. If we're if we are building the API, we build controls into our API to sort of manage those things, right? So if we get something like that that comes in, we might put a timeout on it, right? So that if it doesn't return uh, response within a particular small number of seconds, then we're just going to return a failed response, right? Couldn't couldn't service that request, right? And that gives us the ability to control what uh, people can do with the API. The other is great, great question, great, all great questions and great comments. Um, the other thing we can do is, you know, we can put uh, multiple instances of our uh, API behind a load balancer so that if a request comes in, there could be multiple agents to potentially satisfy that request. But having those types of controls built in where you prevent, you know, a bad request from taking the server down is definitely something you'd want to do as an API creator. OK, great questions. Great comments. Love it. Let's um, kind of keep going here. Let's see where we left off. OK, so we looked at that. Um, all right, let's talk authentication strategies uh, now. OK, because that was, you know, to, to uh, Hamont's point, um, you know, what if you get a bad request, right? Could it take you down? It, it could, right? In this particular case, if I programmatically initiated something to send uh, a bunch of requests to this API since it's wide open uh, in succession, it could potentially take it down. Now, they probably have some uh, things built into the back end. There are things. API uh, developers can build into their APIs to help prevent that. Uh, there's throttling, right? You can uh, indicate that you only want so many requests per second to be allowed. You know, that kind of stuff can be done. But uh, a lot of times what we want to do is uh, wrap our APIs with some type of authentication, right? Cohen had a great question. How many APIs are using Swagger open API file to document and test the API? Quite a few, I think, right? So Swagger is, that's a great call out there. That's a tool. Swagger is a nice tool that you can plug into your API that uh, gives you almost automatically a separate web page that you can use to test all of the operations, right? So we're testing the operations here through the browser, but if we wanted to do a post, or a delete or a, you know an edit that would be hard to do to, uh, through the browser we could do it through a tool like postman we could do it through a tool like insomnia we could build it programmatically but to cohen's point here if you are writing the api swagger is a great tool to uh, sort of very quickly and easily 
wrap your API with a uh, an, a page, a web page that is fully interactive for testing all of those operations. Okay, so I would think there are a lot of APIs that are using that. A lot of the APIs I write use that. Great question, great call out. And uh, with Swagger, there is even a way to sort of uh, manage authentication, right? You can build into your uh, interaction with that API the authentication and authorization as well. Let's talk a little bit about what that what that means. Okay, so <clears throat> high level, right? Authentication versus authorization. Uh, I like to think about it like this, right? Authentication is how do I know you are who you say you are, right? How can I confirm your identity? That's authentication. Authorization is once I know who you are, how can I know or how can I determine what you are allowed to do? And so that gives us multiple sort of layers of security, right? Verifying your identity and then based on your identity, maybe giving you the ability to do more than I can because your identity or role has more permissions than mine. Okay, so that's the handshake there between authentication and authorization. Um, few different methodologies we might use. Uh, often in headers, right, we uh, might leverage something called basic authentication, which is uh, username, password. It's typically, uh, typically considered um, not as secure uh, because that's going to be uh, transmitted over the wire. There's something called a bearer token, which uses a JOT, which we'll talk about in a minute. We might um, also have the API itself might require a key, right? Might require that you set up an account and set up a key and then send that key with every request. And by doing that, they can look at that key and say, yep, yeah, this person or this user or this request is associated to somebody that is authorized to make it, right? And our methodology might include a combination of these, all right? Uh, one thing that I want to touch base on just quickly is, so with OAuth 2.0, that's a modern mechanism, and we're only going to touch the surface. OAuth 2.0 is a very, very deep subject that I would strongly recommend additional research. Uh, but OAuth 2.0 gives you really a more fine-grained strategy. It also allows you to leverage multiple workflows. So um, you can allow folks to log in or, you know, access uh, your site or your API uh, by uh, using their Facebook credentials or their, you know, uh, Google credentials, right? Um, so it gives you multiple uh, sort of workflows. And really uh, what it results in is uh, something called a JWT, JSON Web Token, or affectionately pronounced JOT. And this JOT can include additional detail in it. So I do just want to mention this because uh, JOTs or JSON web tokens are pretty key in the world of APIs. If you uh, navigate to HTTPS JWT.io, you'll find a site that sort of shows you what a JOT is made of. Right. We don't have uh, a ton of time to go too deep into this, but I just uh, thanks for posting those. Hussam, you're right on it. That's awesome. Um, I do want to just touch on this. So a jot is going to have a base 64 encoded section for what's called the algorithm, the header. Right. This will be what is used to secure this. What type of token is it? Then it'll have a middle section called the payload, which that's base 64 encoded, which means it's open, you can see it, right? If you have this jot, you can see this section and this section. The key aspects of jots are the ability to then apply a secret and basically uh, sign all of this, right? And so what happens then <laughs> often is when you wanna use an API, you will um, interface uh, or you wanna use a, a website even, you might hit a login page, You'll enter your username and password. The server will validate that and return you this jot, right? And then your job is to take that jot and send it with every subsequent request. 
Now, if that jot got changed, if it was tampered with, then when it hit the server, the server would try to uh, decode it, unencrypt it, right? Apply the reverse of the signature that it applied to send it to you. And it could tell, hey, this thing has been tampered with. It's no longer uh, available, right? It's, I mean, it's not no longer valid, right? I'm not going to allow this request to come through. So Aslan asked a uh, question, where can I find the recording of this meeting? It will be on the Microsoft uh, Reactor YouTube channel uh, in, you know, probably two, two or three days. Um, so if you go to YouTube and you search for Microsoft Reactor, there's a channel that has a whole host of videos. Yep, there's the there's the link right there that Hussam uh, uh, Hussam just uh, posted. Um, but so jots are beneficial uh, in terms of just from an understanding perspective, right? Because you might have here, uh, if I don't know how well you can see this, but there can be a an expiration built into this, right? So that once you give somebody a token. They can only use it for a certain amount of time before they have to refresh, right? Just keeping our APIs secure. If I wanted to pass in here some additional information, that can get wrapped up and encoded as well, right? And so then we can basically, um, you know, pull that data in. We know that you're an admin and we can determine what you're allowed to do. So JOTs are very valuable, very important you know, would probably take uh, an eight hour uh, session on its own. Unfortunately, we don't have time. We're running a little low, so I'm gonna move on. But uh, jots are definitely something that you'll wanna be kind of aware of. All right, um, let's talk the Q Cooper Hewitt API, okay? <clears throat> So with the Cooper Hewitt API, this is going to be an API that requires a token and a key. This is going to be a little bit more secured, right? So if I open this uh, homepage, I need to be logged in. So you'll need to set up an account. I'm logged in already. I can now create a new API key. Give it a name. You could use a callback URL, which is a, a mechanism with an OAuth 2.0 to give uh, the security uh, function a place to come back to after it validates. We don't need that in this case. I'm just going to register. It says, hey, I agree that I'm going to play nicely and not be creepy. So now I have a key. And then as an additional layer of security, using that key, I can create an access token. And so uh, for my access token, I want read permissions. I only want it to be available for an hour. And I'm going to confirm that. So now here is my access token. Let me copy this. Now, this isn't a JOT, right? It's in a different format. It's a proprietary format for this API. I mentioned JOTs because you're going to see them in a lot of cases. This is something different. I'm going to copy this and just paste that over here. So we have it uh, in uh, the next for the next sort of uh, operation. And now with the Co Cooper Hewitt API, I can execute, for example, this request right here. Let me grab this. You'll see, you know, it's uh, I'm hitting uh, this API. I have an access token that it expects me to pass in with my request. And then I have some additional data that dictates, you know, kind of what I'm some parameters around what I'm what I'm looking for here. Right. And so what I can do is I can take this access token. So let me do this. If I put uh, blah in here. Right. And then I copy this. Paste it over here. It's going to give me an error likely. Right because that's an invalid access token, right? So that's a way to sort of control access to the API. If instead though, I grab my real token, put it here and then copy and paste this, I'll get potentially results. These are links to a bunch of different, you know, uh, exhibits, a bunch of different periods right, that we could then potentially drill down into, all right? 
And then, you know, right now they're formatted in kind of a funny way because of the browser and the transmission. But if we grab, you know, it's basically one of these, for example. We could hit that and get access to this information, right? We could get access to this data and through the API, you know, provide links dynamically, for example, to this uh, art collection. All right. A couple of more slides, couple of more minutes. Um, responses, just want to talk quickly about responses. REST and API is often built around this sort of concept of request and response, right? So the request detail might come in on the URL. It might be part of the body of the request, right? And then the response that comes back to us could include uh, a status code, likely, but it, then it may optionally include some additional data that dictates what the response is coming back to us, right? Depending on the type of request, it might only include a status code. Some of the common HTTP status codes you might encounter uh, are listed here. 200 is a very common one. That means everything was good. 401, 403 is if you, you have an authentication or authorization problem. Uh, 400 is usually a bad request, was formatted improperly. 500 might be just an error at some type of internal server error. The application or the API is down. But what, you, what you'll do is as you make this call, and especially programmatically when you make this uh, API call within your code, you can check that status code to determine whether or not the uh, call was successful, right? So HTTP status codes are beneficial from that perspective. Let's talk uh, about libraries real quick. <coughs> With, um, you know, we've looked at multiple options. We've just been sending requests through the browser, which is just a simple get. There are tools like Postman or Insomnia. There's Swagger as well that uh, uh, Cohen, I think, or I think it was Cohen brought it up, or Hemant maybe. Um, and then there's programmatically uh, using a library, right? And so there are multiple libraries available depending on the language that you are building in that facilitate your programmatic integration with APIs. And we're gonna look at one of them here real quick. Okay, and I know we're running out of time. We're gonna go over a little bit, hopefully that's okay. Um, if you're using JavaScript, Axios is a great library. Right. If you are writing an application in a PowerShell, there's an invoke dash rest method commandlet. Requests is a library that's used with Python. And then there's HTTP client with C sharp. Now there are other languages, uh, obviously, and other libraries, but here are four that are kind of touched on. If we look uh, here in the use libraries, uh, this is one of the cool things I, I, I like about Microsoft Learn is um, you can uh, choose, uh, it gives you the option uh, in, in some cases to choose a different language. So if I choose JavaScript, the instructions are going to be in JavaScript. If I choose Python, the instructions will be in Python, right? So that's very cool, that sort of context aware. We're just going to look quickly at JavaScript. And so I am going to, um, here in my VS Code, I'm going to close, actually, I'm going to stop that. Put this down for a minute. I'm going to create a new file called index.js. And then I'm going to copy this code and paste it. Okay. So this is going to use a library called Axios to submit a GET request to this Cooper Hewitt API. I'm going to need to put in my access token, right? So let me grab that here. But when I run this, this will allow me using Node to programmatically integrate with this API. And what we're going to see is the results sort of just printed to the console. Now it's going to it's not going to be pretty, but hopefully you get the idea. So let me clear this. Uh, first thing I need to do, I'm going to save this. 
I'm going to do an NPM install of Axios because that's a library that I need to pull in. And now if I run node index.js, we see here is that response, right? Here's that programmatic response. Using Axios, we've been able to submit a GET request through code. And here is the data that we have back, the response.data. Okay, one last thing. Um, if we, and I'm going to call this out because there's a little bit of a bug in this, and I want to draw your attention to it. Let me copy this code. This is going to be a little different. What this is going to do is still use Axios, but this is going to execute a post against our local API. Okay, so uh, this file here, db.json, has the last ID is four. Let me open up uh, a new bash terminal. Let me run my JSON server. That's awaiting requests. If I come back to my first and run this, if I run node index.js, I got an error. Why did I get an error? Well, what you actually need to do is you need to have here and HTTP. So if you're running through this or walking through this, I want to draw your attention to that. If I add HTTP in and run this again, it shows that it created a new one. If I come over here to my db.json file, there's my new item. I could run it again. I'll give it a different ID. I'll leave the rest of the information the same. Now I have ID six. And you can see that it is building this out. So, you know, using uh, these programmatic techniques, these libraries, we're able to quickly, um, you know, access this, this information, this code, okay? All right, so I know that was a little bit of a whirlwind there at the end. We're gonna skip knowledge check. Summary-wise, what did we cover? We talked about what APIs are. We talked about uh, using REST to interact with different types of APIs. We kind of dug into the specifics of REST a little bit, and then we talked about using libraries through code. Here's some uh, links sort of uh, just that have already been sort of uh, posted there. Let me post them again. Mm. That includes the link to the GitHub repository where you can find the slides. Okay, so uh, what I wanna do now, if you can uh, hit this uh, survey um, with event code 13084 that um, uh, Hassam posted um, earlier, this is a great opportunity for you to provide some feedback, what types of things you want to see, right? Any any feedback you want to provide on this session. And then, um, you know, definitely thanks for posting that again, Hussam. Um, I'm going to hang out for just a sec uh, to see if there are any additional questions or comments. Thank you, Alan, for taking us through this journey and uh covering all the fundamentals about uh, APIs and RESTful APIs. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, the session is uh, being recorded and it will be available later on our YouTube channel. Uh, I have the links uh, there in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure what someone mentioned maybe uh, that if they joined later, now the chat is not showing the past messages. So if there is anything that you need, uh, uh, also ping us on the chat. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to have the mic on and ask a question, we can also uh, have that uh, enabled uh, for you. Uh, we're over time actually, uh, but Alan uh, is happy to answer your questions if you have any. Um, yeah. And yeah, spend a couple of minutes on the reactor survey. Give us your feedback on the topics that you would love to see at the reactor and feedback on today's session as well. Yes. So uh, you will need to use uh, the event ID there on the uh, link. Uh, so today's session is 13084. Um, yeah, awesome.
Yeah. So, it was a Jonas pleasure saying thank you. you. Yeah. 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 Thanks. You, you, you're welcome, John. I'm glad you were here. Uh, it was definitely a pleasure being with each one of you today. I hope you got a lot of good information out of this. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, I think that's all for today. And yeah, we'll see you next week. Uh, don't miss uh, our next workshops. Uh, we are having a, uh, workshops every Wednesday on various uh, fundamental topics like uh, today's um, workshop. Thank you, Ellen, again. Yep, you got it.